Wonderful. Welcome, everyone. We're just going to give a moment to uh, allow the numbers to climb uh, as the participants join, uh, and then we'll get started. So as soon as the as the number of participants looks like it's reaching a, a plateau, uh, it's climbing swiftly right now. Um, we've got a, 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 a large uh, audience signed up, um, and I think there's a lot of excitement that's built around this event. Um, so I'm very, very much looking forward to hearing the discussions as they go along. Um, okay, so we're um, we're I, I think we have reached a plateau where it's appropriate to to start. So I'm going to give a brief introduction, and then I'll hide myself away and hand over to our panelists for their discussion. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all um, on the behalf of the Landscape Research Group, which is an international network of scholars, all with an interest in the, in the dialogic and engaged subject of landscape. Um, we're very interdisciplinary, we're very uh, open, and we publish Landscape Research Journal. Uh, this event is really very much an indicator of the kinds of things that we're interested in talking about. Um, and uh, certainly we're keenly interested in this discussion uh, as, that, that lies ahead. Um, I will pass over to Corinne Fowler, who is the author of this remarkable book, uh, Green Unpleasant Land, uh, recommended for every curriculum and every bookshelf. Um, and uh, I will then, um, uh, Corinne is, uh, at the University of Leicester uh, as a researcher and uh, is also a representative of the quite amazing Colonial Countryside project and is currently at work on another book, which uh, you'll all be excited to know. Um, so uh, I will leave it at that and I'll uh, hide myself in the wings and pass over uh, to you, Corin. Very much looking forward to this. Thanks very much for the introduction and waving my book around. And, uh, <laughs> I've just come back from um, a walk for my new book, which is so, which involves lots of walking around the landscape. You'll be glad to hear. So, it's my ten walks through colonial Britain. Um, I also uh, would apologise in advance if my cats are very noisy because they're fighting a lot at the moment. <laughs> in the background, you might hear them. So, um, I just wanted to thank all the panellists, first of all, for agreeing to be part of this session. And I was asked by Tim and the Landscape Research Group to invite my dream invitees. And so I thought of these people here who all thankfully agreed. So we've got Professor Jill Cassie, the historian and theorist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I came across her work through the book Sewing Empire, uh, Landscape and Colonization. It was really vital to my own book. So thank you so much for coming. And we've got Professor Sari McDesey, who I came across happily as author of the brilliant romantic imperialism. And then Jane, Professor Jane Olmeyer, an historian and author of a very important book, Making Ireland English, with lots more to follow on that subject, which is really immersed in. So it's a pleasure to be here having that, this conversation with, with people of this caliber. And um, the aim really is to think about landscape and empire, obviously. The, 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 I know that the Landscape Research Group has got some brilliant regional networks, and it's such a brilliant opportunity, this, to have a conversation across continents about different colonial uh, historical situations and their legacies. So I'm really looking forward to it. And I thought we could start off by just thinking about how each of the panelists did first arrive at their subject. I know that I came to my subject by reading the work of British Black, British Asian writers about the landscape and realizing that there had been something of a rural term in their writing for, for some 20 years or more. So I just wondered how you came across your own subject. Shall we start with Jill? 
Oh, uh, th thank you. Uh, so uh, I started researching what became uh, Sewing Empire uh, Landscape and Colonization that I published in what seems like an eternity ago, so, so 2005, but the um, research began in the um, very early 90s uh, when I uh, uh, left uh, living uh, in what uh, some would call the uh, open wound of uh, the, the borderlands of uh, Texas, um, or we should maybe call um, Texas um, in the United States, um, where uh, not only is the Civil War not over, the uh, Alamo isn't either. Um, and uh, I should also add that I'm um, speaking from the um, unceded territory of the Ho-Chunk Nation uh, in uh, Wisconsin another um, really vital um, and importantly contested uh, borderland. And I, I came to do an um, MA um, actually at the, the courthold with um, David Sulkin, who had written uh, Landscape of Reaction, uh, which got a major um, backlash um, for insisting on thinking uh, picturesque landscape painting um, in the context of enclosure. Um, and uh, I, thought that I was going to do a project on uh, the picturesque landscape garden uh, and it became clear that uh, the idea of uh, the so-called uh, genius loci uh, uh, was rather a fantasy and that uh, most of these estates were built out of taking away what was there um, and in many instances introducing uh, species uh, that were part of uh, a, um, not just uh, transplantation engine, um, but uh, the transatlantic uh, plantation machine that depended um, so much on uh, claiming uh, territory um, by uh, creating the conditions for um, that uh, terrible legal principle of the, the race nullius um, that uh, if, something is empty, um, then it can somehow be claimed um, and further that one could justify that claiming by making flourish. And so um, one of the, uh, the, the key arguments for sewing empire um, out of that was uh, the, you know, beautiful title of your book, uh, um, Corinne, Green and Unpleasant uh, at Land, um, that uh, this sign of uh, what is supposed to be experienced affectively as pleasant, um, reassuring, safe, um, and somehow uh, forever um, that landscape just is, um, disguises uh, processes um, that uh, are ongoing um, and uh, processes of uh, dispossession uh, that uh, continues to exercise uh, a, a violence that um, we somehow are taught to misrecognize uh, by taking burdency um, for uh, right, um, but also good. Um, and uh, I um, have returned to that um, work that I began in Sewing Empire uh, with a, a new project that's uh, fairly uh, aggressively um, called uh, Necro Landscaping as a way of uh, really insisting in a uh, neologism uh, on uh, the frankly necropolitical um, role of uh, landscaping um, in uh, neocoloniality. Uh, and I could keep going, um, but I, that project is, is deeply interested with um, and uh, thinking with explicitly uh, art projects um, by uh, a range of uh, artists from uh, the Americas, from uh, Asia, from uh, uh, the African diaspora, um, who uh, are not just raising key questions, but uh, really using alternative uh, landscaping practices. So uh, key figures uh, like uh, Maria Teresa um, Alves uh, in the United States, uh, Keon Williams, uh, um, and you know, I, I could um, bring up some images later if, if we like, um, but uh, what really brought me, I think, to the subject uh, is also um, perhaps uh, where the personal crosses the social and political and as a um, queer diasporic subject uh, uh, who, uh, family was uh, aggressively um, displaced from, from Europe, uh, Jewish refugees uh, who have no claim um, whatsoever to be um, in the United States. And as a uh, 
Jew who refuses to uh, be a Zionist um, and uh, has dedicated so much of their work to thinking of the um, aggressive uh, policies of um, Palestine, it has always felt a, uh, an imperative uh, to um, think about the, the role that, that landscaping um, plays in uh, neo-colonial processes of really violent dispossession. So uh, thank, thank you very for much. That's, that's so interesting. Asking. Um, shall we go to Jane next? Hi, thanks, Corinne. It's lovely to be here. I was going to say, compared to you, Jill, my story is, I was going to say, much tamer in, in some respects. But what brought me to Empire actually was growing up in Belfast in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. Um, I moved there in 1969, which was the year after the Troubles broke out. But I moved there. I'd been born in Africa. So it was very interesting, even as a very young person, um, to, 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 to see how the 17th century is still alive. It's part of the DNA of so many uh, uh, Irish people. Um, uh, so I, I, you know, I then became fascinated by the early modern period and particularly in Ireland. Uh, uh, and Ireland, of course, was a laboratory for empire. The Irish were, if you want, the victims of empire. Ireland was England's first colony but also many Irish people, both Catholic and Protestant, were active perpetrators um, of, of empire. And so we have this extremely complex and quite challenging um, relationship with empire that is very much uh, driven by sectarianism, by tribalism, by culture, by, you know, and, and, and identity is, is formed in the present by events that took place in the early modern period, um, obviously plantation, colonization at, at home. And, and I really just wanted to explore those issues. And I've been exploring those issues over the course of the last um, 30 years. And many of my books uh, have keep on coming back to this. I delivered the Ford lectures in Oxford uh, last spring on Ireland empire in the early modern world partly in response to some of the contemporary things that are going on and we can come back and uh, but also because I think it's very important that Ireland is front and center of any discussions around empire and I've been very struck partly because of the troubles how Irish historians myself included have been very reluctant to engage with issues around empire and then how mainstream if you want imperial historians just conveniently ignore Ireland uh, because they don't know quite how to engage with Ireland. It's problematic in so many respects. And I just think the moment has come for a very different conversation, a, a much better informed conversation. And on the one hand, I suppose we in, living in Ireland need to confront that imperial past in a way like we haven't before. But also I think it's how we are, uh, written about, engaged with by the wider uh, 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 community as well. But it's very complex, lots of sensitivities. And sadly, as we know in Ireland, because of Brexit, I, I'm the first to mention the B word, we're seeing very real political sensitivities being poked and stirred up. And um, the peace process is uh, now you know, being threatened by um, events at Westminster. So, so it's a very, very, very live issue. Um, uh, so, so Corinne, uh, I'll maybe stop there, but, but it's, it's one of these conversations that I've been engaging with, as I say, my entire uh, uh, academic career. And it's only now become trendy, if you know what I mean. It's like when I began, I mean, it's like, what do you want to work an empire for? It's, anyway, it's, 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 as I say, the moment has finally come where others are interested in it as well. Well, I'm glad to know, and, and, and um, you've you've also illustrated exactly why historians um, are so needed at this time. You know, it's never been such a moment for for public historians, and I certainly learned nothing about the English and Ireland when I was growing up at school. So I think there's a, a need to reckon with it on this side of the um, the sea. And um, sorry, um, I think it's we're going to have a a, a productive and extraordinary conversation given given the range of interests already uh, that we've already heard about. But I mean, I guess my background is, I mean, I came to English literature and 
uh, to English, to British Romanticism in, in particular, um, with a background uh, as a Lebanese and Palestinian. So the, 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 the concept of colonialism is one that I know, you know, sort of in a firsthand kind of way as a living thing, not as something that's only historical. Um, and I, and my work on, on British literature began with, with this sort of, with seeing things that I guess other people weren't seeing. This is in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Um, and I, it was impossible not to see the kind of resonances in, in British romantic writing in particular between uh, the British empire overseas and what was happening within Britain itself. And partly, of course, that means places like Ireland, which you know, which as 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 we've reminded, is is one of the, was one of the first places colonized by the by the English, but also places like the west of Scotland, the, the Scottish Highlands, and so forth. But but also England itself, which is and that that's kind of what often sort of drops off the radar is that England itself, in in, in various kinds of ways, was also there were let's say colonial projects that were put in place within England itself, within places like London even, but certainly in the in the countryside at large and in the transformation of the landscape that took place. So that it's, uh, so my, my work has always been interested in, in this kind of, in these sorts of dynamics internally to Britain, as well as in relationship to the, to the empire overseas. Um, so, I mean, I can, give, I can give some examples of that kind of thing, the, the way in which certain populations within, and I want to be specific within England, because I mean, I, I think the case of Ireland and places like Scotland or Wales is very, very obvious. And I, don't, I mean, it needs more work, of course, but it doesn't need to be justified. But in England, it's a bit strange to think about a kind of internal colonialism within England itself, because you would think these are all the same people, and you know, these are the kind of the the us as opposed to the the them out there. But it turns out that internally to England, there were already lots of others internally before we even talk about Ireland and Scotland, before we even talk about people coming from Africa or the Caribbean or South Asia and so forth. There were already these internal others. Who were regarded in the in the through the 18th century, really beginning beginning in the 18th century, and then accelerating in the late 18th and on into the through the first half or so of the 19th century, in this extraordinary way of these populations within England who were seen to be not us, uh, and yet of course they they weren't, but they weren't from Africa, they weren't from India, they were they were they were from England, right? And so um, one of the examples of this are the people referred to routinely in 19th century work as Arabs in, inside England. And when I first came across this in my own research on London for my book, Making England Western, I was interested in this idea because I'm an Arab myself. And I thought, well, I didn't know there were all these Arabs in England, in London in particular, I thought maybe a few, but I didn't know there were thousands and thousands of them. And it turns out they weren't, they weren't actually, they weren't Arabs at all. They were, they were people who would today be considered white and English. But from this, the racial standards being articulated in the 19th century, they were, they were seen to be other racially other, not, not, not just in class terms, and I want to emphasize that in racial terms too. And hence their otherness was articulated in, in these racial terms. And I, I suppose among the many possibilities that came up to draw on to be able to articulate who these others were was the figure of the Arab because the Arab was seen to be wandering and shiftless and you know, displaced and sort of nefarious and, and you know, all that kind of, and, and that all those racial qualities are projected upon this population that was internal. And you can see these kinds of transformations taking place throughout England, I think, in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, if you think about the poetry of John Clare, for example, uh, which is incredibly powerful poetry about the transformation of his particular corner of England in the, in the early 19th century, you can't, at least from a Palestinian perspective, you cannot but read that and think about the, the displacement and transformation of other territories, too, in the name of call it what you want, improvement, modernization, colonialism, whatever, whatever the, the category is, but the, but the processes on the ground look remarkably similar. So I'm interested in trying to think about how, how these dynamics play out kind of across the borders separating, you know, what one, what one might think of as the metropolitan home space from colonial territories as close as Ireland or as far as Africa or India or whatever. I hope that kind of makes sense, Corinne. Yeah, that's amazing. And you, you sort of made me um, think about, yeah, the, just the so many parallels that you come across that were made between um, enslaved people in the West Indies, for example, and uh, people who are being mistreated at home. And it's something that's still very current and is often brought up. In the, in the British context. And yet there were, it is important to join up those dots too, um, linking colonial figures 
in the colonies and um, how they behaved there and yet how so many of them were responsible for enclosure and the clearances and so on. So it's interesting that you, you bring up John Clare. And, and in, you know, thinking about landscape then, um, I mean, Jill's already suggested that um, we shouldn't see something too innocent in, in land stewardship and landscaping and verdure and all of that. I mean, I know I got into a lot of trouble for the title of my book, Green Unpleasant Land, because um, it, it just provoked a, a, a lot of, a lot of um, discomfort in people. And to suggest that this was more than stewardship and we shouldn't perhaps see it as such an in, innocent thing. Um, and and uh, um, it, at one point there was a, um, sorry, my son's trying to talk at me, to me at the same time. Um, yeah, at one point there was a, uh, an article in the, in the Daily Mail because I'd made the kinds of links that you all are making in your work um, between colonial commercial networks and the migration of plants and the, and the movement of plants, gardens, landscaping and all of that. And this, there was this article in the Daily Mail saying that um, I'd said gardening is racist. And I can't tell you how many outraged, you stupid woman type emails that I got um, because of that article. But I mean, there, there, there is a, a very much a serious basis for this discussion and an evidential basis for this discussion. So I just wondered if, it was possible to think um, to put it in an illustrative way of some examples of connections between empire and landscape. So for example, I mean, things that I would have come across uh, would be the, um, you know, things like Penryn Castle in Wales, which was the whole estate and all the infrastructure around it and the quarry, the port, the railways, the roads, and the sort of hotel system that sprung up uh, around it because of that is um, was funded by um, Clarendon Sugar Estates in Jamaica and uh, belonging to the Pennant family. Or, and then uh, another example would be Basildon Park, which was bought by an East India company man with a fortune who then went and built Basildon Park itself and started blocking off footpaths and, it, and um, it, it, enlarging the, the estate and so on. So do you have any kind of salient examples that you think illustrate this really well in your work? Do we want to, I don't know who wants to go first, Jane perhaps? Maybe if I start, because chronologically I'm going to take the conversation back in time. Yeah. And before I do, I just want to say what Sari's doing is fascinating. And I actually think that conversation begins even earlier. Um, in other words, you can see it there from the Middle Ages. By the 17th century, it's definitely there. And it's interesting. It's the Arab, it's the Turk, it's the Irish Catholic. Um, uh, and it's very, very racialized. But London is a central, to me, is central to any discussion. Uh, uh, um, it's not just London, but certainly from an Irish perspective, I can't overstate the significance and importance of London. But just to your question, Corinne, in an Irish context, I think you have to remember that from the mid 16th century, the landscape, the national landscape is transformed by plantation and colonization. It's across the entire country. It's not just the odd estate here and there. We have intensive urbanization, commercialization. We have the creation of these big estates. But in addition to that, we have the wholesale expropriation of Catholic lands. I'm talking two and a half million acres is expropriated over the course of the 17th century and transferred from Catholic landholders to Protestant ones. I think what you're seeing in Ireland is up, it's, it's unprecedented and unparalleled anywhere else in early modern Europe in terms of what happens to the landscape on the foot of English, to a lesser extent, Scottish and Welsh. Uh, uh, colonization. I don't know if you guys have been to Ulster, but you know, you drive through Ulster today and you'll see the plantation towns, you'll see the fortified castles, you'll see the direct legacy, but also what it did to the environment in terms of the clearing of the forests, uh, the fencing 
the improvements, um, the orchards, the enclosure, I could just go on and on. So I think that's one very concrete example. And it's a living landscape, as I say, take a drive through Ireland, go to somewhere like Lismore um, uh, uh, down uh, uh, in Munster. But th there's another side to this, and it's to what you're referring to. It's the money that Irish people make on the back of empire that then, of course, changes uh, uh, things. So the city of Dublin, basically the 18th century city of Dublin is built on the back of, of tobacco and sugar. My own institution would be a great example, Trinity College Dublin. Um, uh, but some of the earliest um, uh, transformations in Dublin took place in the 1660s. The founding father of Bombay was a man called Gerald Anger, who made his fortune in the East India Company. And Dublin's first suburb, which is named after him, it's Anger Street, was all built on the back of that Indian uh, uh, capital uh, that his, his brother was a big property developer. And then we've got the big estates that we all know about, uh, uh, Mount Stewart, um, uh, Clandy Boy, uh, the Caledon estates. The, for me though, if we focus on them, we're actually missing so much else in an Irish context. And that's why I think we have to take our chronological lens back in time to the early modern period um, and to ensure that we don't just look at Ulster. Um, obviously, some of the best examples uh, may come from Ulster, but it's a much it's, it's, it's a pan island story. Yeah, that's great. And it's useful to think about how important it is to take that four nations approach as well. <laughs> but I like the idea of chronology because it means that you're not just focusing in on one thing so narrowly that it dwarfs out everything else. And exactly what you say is true of England as well with the estates. It's not just a story about country houses. It's a story um, about about wool, it's a story about copper, it's a story about a whole load of other stuff as well. Um, um, so that's really helpful. Um, the others, I don't know who wants to go first. I mean, I'm happy to just to connect the dots between England and Ireland. If you take an author like uh, Oliver Goldsmith in the, in the second half of the 18th century, in a poem like The Deserted Village, he's making, I mean, even though his, he grew up in, in Ireland, he, you know, he came to England and and he could, you know, he he could he could mobilize his his memory of an Irish village that he probably, I mean, who knows what he even remembered of it anyway. But his memory of this of this pristine Irish village and its transformation mm -hmm. becomes stands in for the transformation of the English landscape as well. And and the the process of enclosure, the process of displacement of populations, the process of land reclamation. And this is the interesting thing. And this and this this I mean, Jane, this might this might be what separates it from earlier moments because. By the time we get to the 18th century, um, even though it's building on earlier moments of transformation and you know expropriation and so on, there's the it's 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 connected to a discourse of improvement and what we now would recognize as, as the beginnings of modernization and, and that those sorts of uh, uh, progressive a progressive language of moving forward and, and improving the landscape and so forth. So the displacement of people is connected is done basically in the name of making things more efficient or, or making agriculture more productive and that sort of thing. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, as Corinne is saying, the, the, the lands, the two things are, of course, the, the people who were the, the, like literally the estate, like when we think about the great English country houses, that wealth came from the empire, a lot of it, right? Sugar magnates or, or uh, people from, from the East India Company who brought their wealth back to England. And then because of this colonial or enabled by their colonial connections, they transformed the English landscape. Again, think about almost any Jane Austen novel. This is what's there always operating in the background. But the other thing is that when we look at the, you know, if you look at the, and this is how I teach my classes, a lot of my classes on, on, on British literature in the 18th and 19th centuries, I show my students, of course, 21st century American students, a picture of what would look to them like a beautiful natural landscape in England. I mean, like what you might, and the people that attack you, Corinne, like the, you know, this might be thought of as England's green and pleasant land. And then, of course, you what so what looks from a sort of naive perspective as green and pleasant and beautiful and natural and pristine and all the rest of it, you can then go into a reading of how it was transformed historically and what those transformations were and the relationship to these other processes that we've been talking about. So, yeah. Yeah, that's in incredibly helpful. Um, Jill, did we? Yeah, we didn't. Well, I was hoping that I might, uh, if it's OK, um, share. Uh, my, uh, I did a PowerPoint. So, you know, as a um, 
art historian, um, landscape historian um, who works in the visual and material. Um, it's hard to uh, talk about anything without insisting that we look at something. And so, you know, uh, I'm going to go rather aggressively here and insist that, you know, the, that the scene that looks so um, pristine and green, um, you know, uh, is not just uh, what we might call um, now uh, the Anthropocene to emphasize uh, that these are uh, not just man-driven processes, but uh, but stewardship uh, is a uh, another name um, for what we could also describe as the process of uh, a kind of global racial capitalism um, that uh, may produce certain kinds of flourishing for some, but also um, produces um, death, debilitation, and decay for others. Uh, and so one could look to um, something like what I have on the screen, um, a uh, anti-monument by um, Keon Williams uh, on the site of uh, the what became the uh, Jamestown Plantation. So one of the key origins of what gets called um, America and now the uh, disunited states. Uh, and uh, there's you know, a reason why uh, it would seem that uh, the uh, American Revolution uh, isn't over. And in fact, uh, the, the US Capitol was you know, stormed uh, in, in, in January uh, in that uh, this question of the um, accusation that you received, Corinne, um, that uh, now are you saying that gardening is racist? Uh, we could think about um, what uh, garden derives from. Uh, it's a, a, a German um, origin um, word um, that comes um, from guard. Um, so stewardship, the other side of stewardship is also a particular kind of guarding, um, um, not just uh, an enclosure, but um, aggressive fencing out. Uh, uh, and it also, uh, therefore, uh, and, and thereby um, raises key questions about property. Um, should land be understood in a property frame at all? Uh, I mean, it's a, a, actually an un, unsettled and unsettling question that anti-monuments like this, that um, reaching toward warmer suns, uh, these branches that are also um, curving arms, um, reaching up to uh, warmth from uh, another world um, are reaching towards uh, another formation uh, are made out of soil um, from an insistence um, that uh, the, ground um, that over which um, there's this uh, ostensibly flourishing overlay, uh, it holds within it uh, remains of, uh, uh, you know, I'm not just archaeological layers, um, but uh, the uh, unknown, um, the unclaimed of historical processes that uh, are um, both violent, but also um, maybe somehow within that um, inhumation, uh, some possibility for transformation. Um, and I wanted to also move really quickly to, uh, you know, uh, from a US context, uh, really key questions are being asked by um, new, what we could call uh, land art projects like Nicholas Gallinin's um, for Desert X um, just this past summer. Uh, I never forget uh, um, that insists that um, we can't raise questions about landscape without talking about uh, this question of uh, should it be property at all um, and also um, uh, whose and uh, can one talk about landscape and colonization without talking about land back, uh, uh, the um, movement uh, within a US context that's also joining other movements around the world to um, insist that uh, well, settler coloniality uh, uh, um, should not endure um, uh, and uh, that uh, it's made not just out of stone um, as in the um, roads must fall movement, but um, also out of plantation strategies uh, that um, look innocent um, and lovely, um, but uh, we can't be raising those questions with all, so with all, without also acknowledging that we're raising questions about uh, not just rightful possession, but the potential for um, needing to uh, 
return uh, uh, what is claimed as property um, that would also within another frame be understood as stolen. Um, and to return to the um, what could also be understood as a rather marvelous um, accusation is gardening racist. Uh, this question of uh, the origins of plants um, and their properties and what they can do um, have been mined really excitingly by projects like Maria Teresa Alves's uh, multi-year, uh, multi-prong um, pro project called Seeds of Change. Uh, and one iteration of that, which uh, was done in Bristol, uh, generated um, this uh, floating um, ballast seed garden. Um, and um, ballast seeds uh, are uh, the seeds um, unknowingly uh, carried along um, in uh, what uh, by one name would be understood as ballast, that is uh, the weight um, put um, into ships uh, to uh, make up for uh, differences between uh, the uh, balancing cargo um, taken in one direction uh, and uh, uh, when uh, making a return voyage, uh, when uh, there's not enough, what is going to rebalance the ship? Uh, and uh, the evidence of ballast seeds that have uh, that will that can germinate for very long periods of time, um, and then uh, at a very different point in time, um, produce uh, some sort of plant that might uh, er erupt um, somewhere. Uh, Alves has. Uh, traced uh, ballast grounds uh, in various parts of Britain um, and Europe, um, as well as uh, then in 2018 in New York, uh, to um, maps of shipping voyages um, to demonstrate the waste side of global racial capitalism. Um, and uh, that is that uh, one can demonstrate via the, the strange uh, not exactly forensic, but rather flourishing evidence of these miscarried uh, seeds that have germinated and grown um, in odd places, the denied other side of a triangular trade um, that was more profitable um, in stolen life than in so-called goods brought back. Um, and so much of what was returned uh, was dirt. Um, and uh, dirt um, with um, these uh, stowaway seeds. Uh, and so then ballast seeds um, become um, this uh, extraordinary means to um, then also, uh, if not reclaim, um, then uh, create um, other kinds of relations. So the um, ballast seed garden um, really importantly uh, is an example of a, a kind of social practice in which uh, communities of uh, Afro-British um, residents of Bristol uh, worked with Alves to uh, grow um, the seeds um, into the plants um, that are now part of this uh, floating garden that vaguely resembles um, the ships of the triangular trade and yet importantly also alters their form. Uh, and I think it's also projects like these that help us understand that that conversation, uh, uh, if you want to call it a conversation, but also frankly, uh, a, a battle, um, uh, you know, a cultural battle um, uh, I, I, it is um, one um, that has to be engaged um, and uh, that their uh, gardening becomes uh, at the same time uh, a, a means to raise um, absolutely um, central issues about uh, sovereignty, um, claims to property, uh, uh, and basic um, rights, but also uh, key questions for what we do now um, out of, of what one can also understand as a ground um, that's not only contested, but, uh, but full um, and full of uh, uh, complicated uh, um, and discordant um, affect feeling and claim. Uh, no, that's great, thank you. And those um, those images are, are really powerful, and and you could discuss them forever, couldn't you? They're, they're so much, they're so rich. Um, I mean, one thing that does strike me is the the level of dis you know, stuff at the level of discourse, and obviously we're talking about um, sort of 
hidden land struggles, ongoing land struggles, um, concealed land struggles, et cetera, et cetera. But there's also this very powerful discourse, which various of you have mentioned at, at particular points. And I, it makes me think very much how when uh, I was co-authoring the National Trust report and there was a real backlash on that report into its um, houses and estates connections to empire in various ways. But there was part of this backlash was an insistence on preservation and conservation, not critical history. And there was this real discourse of benign uh, conservation, uh, preservation, benign gardening as something benign, um, planting as something benign. And I just wonder if that is perhaps not surprising to any of you. I don't know if anybody's got anything to add to that. <laughs> I mean, it's benign. It, it's there's a there's an an extraordinary kind of reverse. Um, I don't know what reverse. And it's not quite reverse engineering, but yeah, this this sense that an enterprise that from the beginning, as you're saying, Corinne, was was clearly connected to discourses of empire and, and governance and surveillance. I mean, think about Kew Gardens in London, for instance, which is completely bound up with the logic of empire. Um, you, I mean, from the very beginning, there, these connections were there. If you th even think about the, the discourse of, you know, naturalizing or domesticating certain kind of plants and this, I mean, like the whole, you, you can't separate the, the, the very vocabulary we have for thinking about gardening, let alone landscape on a larger scale, right, or 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 agricultural gardens and that sort of thing, from from the discourse of empire and, and these other things that were again colonial networks and so forth that we're talking about, it's it's it seems, you know, but the but there's also this sense that there's a there's I mean you know in Britain as in the U.S. as in no doubt other places as well, there's this incredible attempt in our in our this is one of the signal things about our moment is this attempt to kind of from a certain political perspective to to go back to and 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 cleanse uh, uh, you know the some of the darkest racial histories of of the modern world and turn them into some into something suggestive of something you know more more pristine or beautiful or innocent or whatever and it's just, I think obviously it feeds into that wider context that's what that's very much part of what's going on here I think yeah and it's it's still very prevalent in heritage discourse you know i come across it all the time and the um it the the contrast between the way in which uh, a, a a country a state for example is described on some website somewhere is this kind of seat of civilization <laughs> you know it's still going on you know that's a kind of legacy of of uh, hiding on what hiding what's going on off stage um, elsewhere as well, but also um, what was displaced in order to create that landscape sort of more locally. Um, I was just wondering if there's any, oh Jane, did you want to add anything before? Well, I just, I, I think it's fascinating, Corinne, and I think context is hugely important here, and this is where the historians are, play a very important role, um, and, and the critical was, you know, it, it, we need to be critical, we need to be able to ask those awkward questions, uh, and now is the moment to, to do it, and not just about the big houses and the National Trust properties, but, but everywhere, and that's obviously where your work is, is so important, and, and of the groups uh, uh, at this in this conversation. Um, in an Irish context, obviously we've got Northern Ireland, which is part of, of it's Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and we've got the Republic of Ireland, and we've just celebrated, if that's the right word, marked a hundred years of, you know, we're, we're in the decade of commemorations. Um, and recently our president um, uh, gave one of his big, Maknov 100, big, he gave three big lectures. And one of the three was actually on empire. And he basically said, we've been suffering from imperial amnesia. And that actually for the Irish, um, you know, it's, it's very important that we now begin to engage uh, with empire, not to sugarcoat it and cleanse it, uh, to actually engage with it, it warts and all. And he's obviously saying that in the context of partition, in the context of civil war, um, which is what we're now, you know, we're in the year of which Ireland, you know, partition, we're coming into a period uh, uh, when uh, uh, Irish people fought Irish people. So it's a, a very difficult moment. 
but but actually engaging with these issues uh, around empire, those echoes of empire, those colonial legacies, is something that he is calling for, and that we are increasingly having a national conversation uh, in, in the Republic of Ireland around. But but the current political context does complicate that. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. And that's to your point and the importance of doing it. It is the moment, and um, in a sense, what we need is more research. Uh, uh, and more investment uh, in actually getting to the facts of all of this and, and understanding the context better. So I, I, I really believe that, we, we, and we need to be pushing for that. Yeah, completely. And I think in very uh, locally inflected ways, as big as as well as those big national pictures as well, because each each region is so distinctive, isn't it? And each um, each nation is so distinctive in its own way. And um, one of the Obvious. Well, there are a couple of questions I'd like to sort of cover before we throw it out to questions for the audience. But one of them is um, the question of whose history is this and who should be studying it? And what, you know, why is it helpful, as I think we probably all believe it is, for, for historians to work together with artists and lay researchers, uh, first of all. And secondly, if you do have an answer to this, are there, for, the, for those who want to study this topic of landscape and empire, which is such a vast topic, are there any methodological kind of top tips <laughs> that you could give people or any kind of useful methodological approaches, you know, to the how to actually go about this? What, you know, what, has, what have people found fruitful? Anyone want to go first? Do you know, let me just, I, I'm happy to, to just get going because a couple of things you said there. One is that we need to do it in an interdisciplinary way. I was very struck by the image that Jill just shared. I think that creative artists and practitioners are able to make um, audible what later becomes visible. In other words, they help to create that roadmap that we all need. Um, uh, 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 the literary specialists bring something to the conversation, the historians do, but also to engage with the curators, whether they be of the big houses, museums. Um, uh, so the practitioners need to be part of the conversation as well, but also people, because I think at the end of the day that you know, we, you can't be judgmental and proprietorial about this. It, it cuts to the core of identity and it's about listening to people's stories and experiences. I don't have any methodological um, top tips for you, but I must say I'm involved in a project and I think she's in the audience, Bryony Wittis from Queen's University in Belfast. And basically it's a grant we're putting together in the context of a shared island. Uh, uh, it's it's a, a, an Irish grant. And for the first time, the historians are talking to the anthropologists, are talking to the art historians, are talking to the colleagues in the museums. I wouldn't underestimate the importance of just having the conversations across disciplines. And as I say, across, if you want, the civ civic organizations, um, uh, 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 cultural organizations, because the truth is that that story is only just beginning in a meaningful way. So, so uh, it, you know, it, it, for me, this is these sorts of conversations are essential in in the doing. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, Jill, and then Sari. Or I'm happy to go last too, if you'd rather. Um, okay. I I, um, I so appreciated uh, the uh, the question about the methods and uh, the you know insistence that uh, we uh, need to think about uh, how deep our histories go um, and what histories we're telling and from what vantages uh, and uh, a key aspect of that sort of fairly. Um, aggressive neologism of um, the Necrocene uh, was to build on work of climate scientists uh, who developed the Orbis hypothesis uh, to argue that the beginnings are not um, with uh, the atom bomb or, or with uh, what is conventionally understood as the Industrial Revolution, but rather uh, the world 
uh, transfer of, if you want to euphemize, uh, uh, of um, plants, uh, microbiological agents, uh, um, humans, uh, that is also in Alfred Crosby's work called the Columbian Exchange um, that led to uh, massive death. Um, and uh, that uh, the beginnings we could say, I mean, they have a, give a sort of rather interesting date. Uh, so um, 1610 um, is the, the beginnings of what has otherwise been called the Anthropocene. Uh, and uh, that tags rather interestingly, I think, to the, um, the story that you're uh, really importantly insisting on Jane as well, and um, that uh, we could be frustrated. So, you know, why are the historians taking us back? But I think that that, that shift in uh, perspective that um, different kinds of um, histories allow us to understand is that uh, we can then, um, I, I think, uh, ask uh, very very different kinds of questions to make very different kinds of arguments and demands um, on the present. Uh, uh, and then from there, I think I'd also want to, uh, uh, to your question, Corinne, about uh, methods, uh, say that uh, some versions of interdisciplinarity might be uh, that uh, an, uh, a literary scholar, uh, um, art historian, visual studies scholar, um, uh, um, historian, uh, uh, um, or historians come together in a conversation, um, importantly so, it can also be that we are all, each of us, also interdisciplinary in our own ways. I think we are in our methods. Uh, and I, in working with and thinking with artists, uh, I am also myself one, uh, I, Research um, uh, practice um, for the arts uh, now has a, a fairly long and, and substantial history. Um, just to give um, uh, one example, uh, the, the work of Maria Teresa Alves builds on uh, the uh, work of a forensic botanist um, who uh, uh, found that uh, seed banks uh, can uh, persist dormant um, for centuries. Um, which um, does something really interesting um, to um, the historical record, um, but also, you know, uh, uh, the possibilities of a certain kind of latency um, that can emerge at, at another point. Uh, and uh, we have uh, derived a particular version of uh, history as timeline uh, from uh, a, uh, what is it, ar arguably an 18th century technology um, for plotting along a certain kind of linearity um, that is its own artifact of empire that um, these uh, other kinds of collaborations across, uh, uh, you know, arts, science, um, humanities, uh, and frankly, uh, public policy, uh, derive ways of uh, offering, um, uh, you know, uh, other ways of uh, understanding our, our, our current predicament, right, on a um, what we could say is now uh, a dying planet. Uh, um, and I, I saw in the, the question uh, at chat, you know, um, okay, you know, so why aren't we also talking about food sovereignty? And I, I think that we are. I mean, uh, the the theft of land uh, uh, and uh, its so-called control, um, uh, this stewardship that, that claims to be about preservation um, has made life unlivable um, for most of the, the planet. Um, and um, so uh, I, I think that we are um, talking about the ways that uh, what would seem to be historical questions are also very urgent um, contemporary political mm -hmm. ones about the, uh, the, the ground of being. Uh, yeah, and um, the methods for that uh, really have to be interdisciplinary and collaborative. Yeah. Completely, completely agree. And um, sorry. I mean, I would just echo what, what Jill and Jane just said, because I, I mean, absolutely reaffirm what they both said. And the question of interdisciplinarity is important. And I mean, I would just, I mean, it's sort of implicit in, in, in what Jill was just saying as well, but the but the importance of looking at different contexts or, or working kind of comparatively across contexts is also super important. I mean, and, and you know, the, there are countless examples that one could think of, but I mean, among others that are, you know, important to my own work, for, like what does it mean, for example, that, you know, when the first the first proper, you know, proper kind of scientific maps were produced of London, for instance, what was the institution doing it? It was the British Army. It was the Ordnance Survey, right? And and this, so in other words, when they came to map London for the first time in a really proper way using trigonometry in the in the middle of the nineteenth century, they were they were applying to London, the heart of the empire, techniques that they developed in Ireland and India and other 
more properly kind of colonial or imperial spaces. So what, is, what does that tell us about the, the landscape logic driving in that case, a branch of the of the of the army, and and how is it thinking about surveillance and control and domination across these contexts? It seems to me essential that we need to link these contexts together and bring them because the, you you may like one wouldn't see these things necessarily focusing only on England or only on this space or that space, but when you bring the spaces together, you start to see patterns emerge um, that really wouldn't be you wouldn't see the patterns unless you brought them into 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 connection into dialogue with one another. So I think that's important yeah. as well. Well, that's excellent. And you you just made me think, you know, while you were talking there, I was um, just, I just got a copy of this book just out, Human Capital and Empire, Scotland, Wales, and uh, Scotland, Ireland, you'll be glad to see Jane, and Wales and British Imperialism in Asia, 1690 to 1820. And it is all about land use, land struggle, and everything else. But it's brilliant for methodology, because it this is an economic historian who takes you through like loads and loads of different sources to show you how he reached his uh, conclusions. And it, it's really, really quite detailed. So I recommend that. Yeah, Human, Human Capital and Empire, it's only just come out. Is, is it by Andrew McKillop, Corinne? Of course, yeah. <laughs> Andrew, the good old Andrew McKillop is doing some great work there in, in Scotland with his amazing colleagues. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, okay, well, we, we are passing over to questions because we and we'll go on till about quarter past um, because I know, you know, we've spent quite a lot of time in the panel discussion. And so if we if we have a look at what um, people have asked, and, and thank you very much for that. And actually, before I forget, because I will forget, um, I, my Colonial Countryside project has done a, a free massive open online course called Country Houses and Empire, which will be available on Future Learn at the University of Leicester. Um, and you can do that online. It's a six week course and I've done it with people from the Legacies of British Slave Ownership, the East India Company at Home Project. So it's, it's a really, it takes you through that, that kind, those kind of landscapes and it does include gardens as well. Um, anyway, yeah, the question to get back to the questions. Um, we've got one from Alice Wardle. What ideas do the panel have in framing or facing this issue of land ownership and the immediate need to look at food sovereignty, health, and well being? Well, I think we've kind of touched on answers to that. I don't know if anyone wanted to add anything. I mean, in a way, we could go on about uh, bread, fruit and potatoes <laughs> and the idea of cheap food and all the trouble that that caused and um, the, the kind of wider colonial processes involved in that. But, you know, that's again an, an historical general point. I, I mean, I think I might just add that uh, I, the uh, issue of uh, local control um, and uh, uh, local um, um, gar gardening projects, um, um, distributed seed projects, mutual aid projects um, are all instances of um, insisting on um, not just uh, other networks and processes that are uh, absolutely about local determination, um, but uh, an entirely different, we could say optic. Um, so the uh, particular regime of visuality that um, I'm sorry was uh, discussing um, that we see in uh, the mapping projects that give us the, the first maps of territories and the borders that have become naturalized, um, that that's a particular kind of um, view from above uh, uh, that um, is also naturalized and reproduced um, by the, the massive um, expropriation and relandscaping projects that Jane was describing. That is that they also produce a view um, and uh, it makes it extremely difficult um, to, uh, I mean, what do we do when um, we learn any um, subject, but also frankly um, on the news, um, we, we show um, an issue relative to uh, not just a map um, of the world, but a particular perspective that produces the world that includes um, the view from the immersed 
ground uh, of, I mean, it, 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 it's, an, it's not a match um, and, and purposefully so for what it looks like um, in a food desert, um, for example. Um, and uh, so, you know, part of what um, we can do I'm pushing back maybe just a little bit on, on this quantitative moment um, that would insist that everything that we need to know um, is something that we can produce by an algorithm. I would also suggest that part of what we need are uh, precisely uh, the, uh, I mean, perspective you could understand as a euphemism for, um, you know, other perspectives, but I mean this in a very concrete and material way. That is that, uh, can you even, uh, look back um, at power um, uh, from a different position if you don't have some means of presenting that um, and making that shareable. And so part of uh, food sovereignty issues are also then uh, uh, issues of, uh, frankly, political representation um, that is also about um, view making. Um, and uh, that's where also alternative gardening practices are, are, and uh, um, social mapping practices are, are so key. Thank you very much. Um, can I just add a word, just, uh, just listening to Jill there, just very quickly, I'd like to make three points. It's very interesting when you look at Ireland, the way it, from the mid 17th century, Ireland effectively becomes a subservient economy. We have economic imperialism um, and the whole, it, it's very agricultural. It's all about provisioning England and provisioning, provisioning the British Empire. Um, and, and obviously profoundly shapes Ireland because it's only in pockets that it industrializes later. But not just that, I think what's very interesting, and you mentioned potatoes, so I have to mention the famine, is the way that if you want famines, Irish nationalists and Indian nationalists have obviously accused the British Empire of using famine uh, uh, as a tool of empire. Now, obviously, that's contested, it's debated. But it certainly is very current in the early 20th century um, that famine and, and depriving, uh, 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 you know, however it's legitimated, people of food uh, was an imperial uh, um, tool. And I don't think we can ignore the way that was used uh, 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 over time. The final point I want to make goes back to the mapping one. And I loved what Sari had to say about 19th century uh, uh, London, because actually uh, mapping, cartography is a very, very imp important tool of empire. And Ireland is probably the most mapped country um, in the early modern period. And somebody like Sir William Petty, the father of political economy, uh, mapped Ireland uh, in a way that wasn't seen anywhere in the modern uh, uh, world. And the skills that were tried and tested, of course, then were taken to India. But it's very interesting to hear that they then came back uh, uh, to London. So I simply just wanted to add that. Well, those were amazing points as well. And um, just moving on to the other question, there's um, a long and I'm sure not half baked thought. <laughs> Which I do quickly want to say, I did not say gardening is racist, it's just the Daily Mail said I said it was. <laughs> um, just because I mentioned empire and plants in the same, um, the same chapter of my book. Um, but the, um, yeah, the question is, have any of the researchers on the panel considered or come across non-political narratives of empire and landscape? For example, have you come across understandings of colonial landscape through the lens of Ophelia? or searching for home. I'm asking this because in understandings of cultural minority rights and immigration, many people use gardens to grow the fruits and vegetables of their homelands to stay connected to these places. These activities can also be seen as decolonial acts or acts of resistance. How would this action relate to, or is it different from gardening as a, a racist or colonial act, as was mentioned earlier? Anybody on that? So can I just give a quick shout out to a chapter in Sewing Empire um, on revolting landscape um, that um, precisely understands um, like landscaping. So for example, um, the ways that um, uh, uh, forcibly enslaved um, um, peoples uh, in um, the Caribbean, for example, uh, used uh, the provision grounds and what were at the time called slave gardens um, so dedicated parts of um, the master's estate that um, were to save masters from even the cost of feeding um, those um, uh, lives they had stolen uh, I were um, also used to uh, precisely um, grow 
um, not just uh, um, uh, provisions uh, from Africa, but also um, all kinds of exotic transplants uh, sold at market, um, what was then called the black market, um, and became um, an, an extremely important uh, um, source of um, those kinds of acts of uh, resistant flourishing, but also uh, to uh, plant uh, uh, herbs and um, plants known for their um, medicinal properties, but also um, poisons. Um, and uh, um, we can also, uh, um, so that's um, one part of it. And the other part of it is uh, that uh, so many of the representations of uh, the um, important uh, slave revolt that led to the Haitian Revolution, uh, and the key freedom revolt, uh, the, the origins of modernity, uh, uh, represented slaves um, attacking um, individual plants and trees, um, parts of the plantation. Um, and those acts we can also understand as a, a recognition of um, the um, the power of um, pa plants um, that is manifold um, and uh, not reducible. Um, uh, that is that they that, that this is at, at a minimum dialectical. Um, and um, so I wouldn't say not political, but um, the political valences, um, you know, as we know, uh, power is is uh, complex and is uh, also produced. It doesn't just come from, but um, is actively produced. Um, so yes, from there we can um, think about current projects. Um, and so uh, one that I'm I'm talking about in one of the chapters of the current book, um, Jumana Mana's uh, amazing work um, with uh, uh, not just um, issues of food sovereignty, but uh, um, seeds uh, and uh, seeds of plants that uh, the uh, the state of Israel has uh, tried to eradicate, um, and um, that those um, seeds are themselves understood as uh, uh, well, um, powerful weapons um, in, a, in, a, in a battle for um, a right um, to, to, to life even. Um, and uh, so, uh, so yes, um, uh, I, um, absolutely. And thank you so much for a wonderful question. And I'm sorry, I, in eagerness, I jumped in. I'm sorry. If I, yeah, if I could add, I mean, I totally agree with what Jill just said. And, and just to go back to the question itself, the there is no, I mean, the, I mean, the question began, begins by asking about a non-political, I don't think there is, there is no such thing as non-political in the context of landscape or gardens or any of the things we're talking about. And I mean, the examples of the politicization of things that seem to be completely sort of benign and innocent and just, you know, unconnected to processes of power and empire are, they're all over the place. I mean, like one that just came to my mind is, you know, Jamaica Kincaid's novel, Lucy, the narrator, she, you know, grow, growing up in the Caribbean, has been has had that shoved down her throat repeatedly. Wordsworth's poem, you know, about the daff. I wander lonely as a cloud about about daffodils, and she's like, I don't even know what a daffodil looks like. And this thing has been, as was the case for people throughout the British Empire, or the ex-British Empire at that point, you know, they're all taught to read this stuff and to venerate Wordsworth and his beautiful clouds and daffodils and on, and so forth. And so this sense that this beautiful, innocent—I don't think it's that beautiful, but whatever—that this in, innocent-seeming poem is uh, you know is detached from power and politics and and and, and so forth is clearly is you know it's not true neither for wordsworth nor for people like jamaica kincaid 150 or 200 or whatever years later so the, so po politics is always there and what 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 jim was just I pointing out on wordsworth uh, his, yeah sorry Wordsworth's brother was of course a uh, captive uh, captain of an east india company ship yeah and yeah. wordsworth and his sister dorothy invested money in in one of his voyages which didn't work out um but the fact is that he wanted to be able to write without having to have a patron you know that he <laughs> that he didn't want and yeah. that yeah. money from opium <laughs> would yeah. have helped yeah. him to do that although it didn't work out it was you know it was tried and tried and tested <laughs> yeah exactly. but even things i mean as joe was saying you know like the the if you talk if you look at the you know the this has happened this came into the news recently the uh, the Israeli zeal of planting forests in, in in Palestine, you know, which which make it look, which give which give the landscape a certain kind of look. All those, not all, most of the forests that were planted in Palestine by the Jewish National Fund and, and other institutions were designed to cover over the ruins of Palestinian villages that had been ethnically mm -hmm. cleansed in 1948. So this, again, what looks so pristine and innocent is certainly you know marketed as pristine and innocent is anything but pristine and innocent. All of these things were always connected to politics. In one way or another, and that, that's—I mean, just echoing what what Jill and Jane are, are, and you, of course, Corinne, are saying too. It's 
politics is always there. So then there's a question of, well, how can we think? And I think that's what the question is getting at. How can we think in terms of resistance to this, these baleful projects of power and, 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 and expropriation and, and that kind of thing? And I think that's, as, as Jill was saying, that's super urgent and we'll find that also across a range of registers and demands. But I think it's very, very important. I'm going to ch chime in if I, I may, because again, I, I love the, the conversation, but what happens in Ireland is it, at times of rebellion, 1641, 1798, the 1920s, the gardens are targeted, the big houses are targeted. I'm most interested in the, the rebellion that happens in the 17th century, and we've got something like 8,000 depositions, eyewitness accounts of what occurred. There was ethnic cleansing, there was extreme violence, but what is so fascinating is the way anything that was associated with improvement was targeted, whether it was the construction of uh, English style dwellings or English gardens, uh, orchards, plantings, um, hedges. Uh, the Irish insurgents systematically destroyed um, that, that environment. Obviously it came back again, but it, 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 it was very much a target. On the one hand, as a historian, of course, it's very frustrating because we've, we lost so much of our physical built heritage, um, uh, but uh, the records are very, very clear that it was a very political act on, 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 on the behalf of the Catholic insurgents. I'm conscious that we've only got two minutes left. So I, is there anything that anyone wants to add? I mean, we did have one more question about whether we have to always go with linear chronologies and whether it might be productive to also uh, look at non-linear narratives and histories as a kind of methodological alternative. I don't know if you want to briefly speak to that, Jane. I don't think anything is linear. I mean, it's, I mean, but no, I've got nothing particularly to say to that, um, except that looking at things in linear ways for me isn't, I love to look at them in entangled ways, in comparative ways. I think that's where the excitement comes because as we've already discovered this afternoon, there are so many ways that these conversations collide. Yeah, I completely agree. And uh, I mean, one thing that is clear is if you look at, say, something like the Scottish Highlands and the, the clearances, it's um, the cumulative and combined effect of Asian money and in Asian engagements and, and um, slave ownership, which actually impact together over different periods of time, cumulatively on that place and on that process of the clearances. So, um, well, I've got to thank everybody and thank everybody for coming and for staying with us um, for an extra quarter of an hour. And thank you so much. And I hope that this um, leads to lots of many more happy discussions to come. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I thank might you. appear as a disembodied voice here because I'm not sure how to turn my uh, uh, video back on now that I've hidden myself. Uh, but I just wanted to thank uh, Corinne especially for putting together this uh, this wonderful conversation. I wish we could spill out into the bar and keep this going for another couple of hours. And I hope perhaps that we will have the opportunity to do that again at some point. Um, I'd love to bring the same group back together. Um, I'd also like to um, uh, say that the Landscape Research Group is really interested in supporting this kind of research. We are a grant giving organization um, and we do help to facilitate networks. I've posted uh, in the chat a, a link to how to get involved with the Landscape Research Group. Um, and I would say, please contact us, even if you're not interested in becoming a member, um, please bring your organization to us. We are fundamentally multi trans and inter and perhaps even post disciplinary. Uh, and, um, and, and so, we, we really think that we're the right organization for this point in time and these kinds of, of discussions. So uh, all I can say is thank you again to, to all of you for, for, for coming along and thank you for this amazing conversation. Thank you. So it thank just so remains much. to move to end the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Total pleasure, thank you.